Hi, welcome to the breadboard and another mailbag. Uh, as you can see from what's in the background right here, this is a uh, very deliberate promotion of one of my uh, larger sponsors, RS Components, out of the UK. And uh, we've been talking over the last few months about various things that I have on my bench and stuff like that. And they very kindly sent me a big package and an even heavier but different shape package of goodies to use on my bench. And so I thought I would do an unboxing and show you what I have in here. Now a lot of the products that have been sent are from the RS Pro brand, hence the big banner put up beside me here. Uh, this was also sent to me as well with the packaging a few weeks ago. Uh, as you can see, it's rather large, so I probably won't be using it all the time behind any of my uh, videos because it won't really fit in the room properly, but nevertheless, uh, be good if I go out to do any shows or anything like that where I uh, take along some RS sponsored equipment and goodies. But for now, we'll just have it in the background for this particular video while we do the unboxing of this mail. Now, I got so much mail over the last few days that I'm actually going to break it into two parts. One, which is this one, is going to be dealing with the RS Pro goodies that are in these boxes right here. And then I'll have another one right after it that will deal with the other items that have arrived. So anyway, let's get uh, rearrange the camera and see what I've got. Okay, let's reset the scene a little bit. Um, as I said, all of the products that are in here are from the RS Pro brand, and I will provide all the links to the RS site where you can get them for yourself. Uh, I'll just get this big one out of the way first because I know what's in here, and it's very heavy, and I'm just going to get it out of the way because I can't lay it out yet. So what is in here is a quite large anti-static mat. It's very heavy because it's rubberized. So this is about four feet by looks like about eight feet. The part number is on the box here, 7872111. And um, it is one of the um, anti-static mats that you would put on your bench to protect your devices and yourself and keep everything nicely grounded um, when you're working on equipment that's opened up and everything else. So these are also typically heat proof, etc. We'll uh, pull up the data sheets on the IRS website and just have a look uh, in a little bit, but um, normally you would put them on the bench like I have here. This is an older one I have on this bench um, that I got quite a while ago. It's a little bit thinner than the RS brands. They are heat proof and they're, what they are is um, dissip dip dissipative um, mats. So if you put a, vo a resistance meter on here, it'll measure hundreds of megs or even into the gig ohms. And the idea is it prevents static from building up but it's high enough resistance that if you put a PCB on here that's turned on, it won't have any impact on it either. So, uh, and they're also usually, you know, uh, heat resistant enough that if you dropped a soldering iron on there or got a splash of solder on it, it's also not going to damage it. Uh, so anyway, that's one of the first items, this really big roll of anti-static mat. And there is a nice smaller roll in here as well. Um, for a smaller bench or um, side bench, which I will also be having. I may put this in where my computer is because I often, when I'm editing, uh, I, I will often have things plugged into the PC, like smaller uh, embedded controllers and things. So having an anti-static mat there also is quite helpful. So this one is more like about 18 inches by um, 3 or 4 feet, something like that. So much better for going on a smaller table. And you can see there are poppers in all the corners so that you can connect it to a grounding point and also connect a grounding strap to the mat so that you're all at the same potential so you don't zap components and things like that. So let me just roll this up and we'll get to the... Okay, that's the anti mat done. Let's uh, start diving into this box. So what I'm going to do is move it across a little bit. We'll uh, pull the items out and just put them on the side of the bench here and then we'll have a closer look. So first on the agenda is a small compact digital multimeter from RS. This is the EN6160-1. It's a Cat3 600 volt multimeter. And we will have a look at that in a moment. We have some PCB maintenance tools, scrapers, blades, component bending point, little brush, uh, anti-static tweezers, we have a third hand with magnifying glass, 
So this is where you just put it on the bench, you would hold a PCB or uh, wires or whatever else you may be doing and a little magnifying glass if you need a bit closer detail while you're soldering or probing or something. We have a pair of project boards, the breadboard type, which is very appropriate for me because I am the breadboard. Um, these are both exactly the same part number. Uh, you can never have too many breadboards when you're doing the kind of things that I do uh, because you may start with a project on one and you really don't want to rip it all off when you want to try and have another project on the go. So having more than one uh, breadboard is always handy so that you can have them left built onto the boards for extended periods of time. To go along with the soldering iron that I got the other day, I have a couple of rolls of RS solder here. One is a roll of leaded solder, 0.38 millimeter diameter. And the other one is a roll of lead free solder, which is 0.81 millimeter diameter. So we have a nice pair of ESD safe RS copper wire cutters made in Italy. Set of anti-static uh, bags for storing circuit boards and com uh, components and various other things. A mystery box. This is a uh, smart power meter that can be mounted into a case. Uh, chassis of some kind and what it has is an RS-485 interface so that you can interrogate it using Modbus protocol to get the readings off. It will measure the volts, the amps, uh, give you power factors and everything else on here. So very, very useful. We'll get to do a review of that in another video. Um, we may power up in this one just to have a quick look though. We have a anti-static ESD safe desoldering tool. Uh, rubber tipped. I'm not sure if it's recoilless. Yep. A container of lead free tip tinner for soldering on. So we'll have a closer look at the specs for that and the uses for it. So in here we have a storage rack that is ESD safe. So one of the things I know I've, uh, you may have seen in some of my other videos in the background are uh, a number of racks that I have. They're actually over that direction, um, but they're not anti-static. This is an ESD safe um, storage rack so that you can put your uh, chips and SMD components in here that are, you know, like your ADD converters and all that kind of stuff and not worry about any static buildup. My other ones, they're just basically polythene kind of extruded or blown out drawers and everything else, so they can build up static charges. So I often will leave the uh, components inside their uh, ESD safe bags and things like that when I store them there because I don't want to damage them or minimize the chances of it. So this would be real nice addition so that I can put my more sensitive components in here. And then the last two bags I have, or the containers, I just kept them separate because this is actually something of interest for another project. Let me just get this box out of the way. Is um, a set of stepper motors. Now, a while back uh, last year, I started a project for CNC controller with RS components, and they were kind enough to provide me uh, a lot of the electronics for that project, including stepper motor controllers, the stepper motors, some power supplies, etc. That was a big CNC that I built. Basically, it could cut anything up to about four feet by four feet. But what I also wanted to build was a smaller CNC type machine, a bit more the size of a Shapoko or something like that, um, that was able to cut PCBs and things, uh, so mill out the tracks and stuff like that. But what that required was to have some more accurate stepper motors and obviously a, a smaller frame. I wanted to be able to use it inside. So what RS have sent me are a set of uh, NEMA 24 stepper motors, but these have a 0.9 degrees uh, rotational pitch per pulse rather than the typical 1.8 degrees. So with the um, CNC project I have out in the garage, 200 steps would be required on the stepper motor 
to do a full rotation. It, with these stepper motors, you have to have 400 steps. So basically, you've got twice the resolution, which is going to be ideal when we start cutting printed circuit boards and uh, more fine circuits and, and uh, projects on the smaller CNC that I'm going to build up. And then the last item, um, I had a set of um, stepper motor controllers that RS sent me from Gecko Drive. And they're great and they work very, very well for the big CNC, but they are quite big and they're, each one is an individual uh, stepper motor controller that you have to mount and everything else. But Gecko also have a um, four channel stepper motor controller in their stable, which is the Gecko Drive and it's the G540 multi access stepper drive. So Irish components were kind enough to send me one of these to use for the smaller CNC that I'm going to build. So what you have is your control signals come in here. This is so that you can hook it up to a computer with a standard parallel port if you want. Or you can go into a breakout from the 25 pin D-type connector out to individual wires and wire them into a separate stepper controller board or something like that. And I actually have one that another company has sent me and I will introduce that when we go through, actually I think I have it quite close here right now. Anyway, and then your stepper motors plug into these nine pin D-type outputs. Uh, so one goes to each stepper motor and there's additional connectors on the back so that you can have limit switches and various other things plugged into this as well. And they all come through to here and then that would either go to your PC with a parallel port, but anybody that has um, gone from older PCs to new ones would know that most new PCs do not have a parallel port and Windows 10 doesn't even support a parallel port. So we'll have to come up, uh, and, we, and I already have that sorted out for this, to integrate to a different controller. And I think that's everything as far as unboxing is concerned. So let's go have a look at, a closer look at some of these components and look at the uh, specs where appropriate on the RS Components website. Uh, I think that the fact that RS have decided to give it the RS Pro um, banner for the various products is a statement to their confidence as to the quality of the products. So let's have a close look at some of these that I've just pulled out of the packaging and we'll have a little look. So the first thing I want to look at is the multimeter. So this is the RS-12 digital multimeter. It's um, got a set of fixed ranges. It's not auto ranging. It's got a separate 10 amp input and a milliamp input, uh, which is also common for the volts and ohms. Um, it's CAT3 rated up to 600 volts, and it does have separate fuses, high, high speed. They're not the same kind of HRC fuses you'll find in a Fluke or a Keysight big multimeter. But then again, this is not an expensive multimeter. We'll have a look at the prices in a minute on the UK website, but it's certainly not in the same price range as you'd find for a Keysight or something. Um, it's only a three, um, three digit multimeter, three and a half digit, we'll check that as well. So its accuracy is only going to be around 1%-ish um, on each of the ranges. You might get a little bit better, a little bit worse. We'll check that again on the website when we go through. But the purpose of this is not necessarily for precision uh, measurements. It's the kind of thing you'd have in your toolbox that you could take out to a site. Um, it's not waterproof or anything like that, but it's certainly good for quick measurements, automotive, um, industrial, et cetera, et cetera. If you want to be able to use it in a lab um, or calibrating ADCs and DACs and things like that from any sort of precision perspective, then you wouldn't normally be getting one of these. But anyway, I put the battery in. Uh, it works off a 9 volt PP3 battery and we'll just set it to some of these ranges and give it a go. Now what I have here is a precision digital voltage source that my friend Ian Johnson um, at www.ianjohnson.com and he also has a YouTube channel makes and sells and he kindly sent me one of these quite a while ago to use in, in my lab and things. So I'm just going to power this up and I can use it to provide some precision voltages just to check the calibration of um, the meter here. So I'm just going to um, clamp this onto the terminal posts. And then we can do some voltage measurements. Okay, so right off the bat, I've given it 
50 millivolts, and you can see here, let me just put this on its stand, make it easier to see, we have exactly 50, I'll believe the backlight on, I think it's easier on the camera. So we have exactly 50 millivolts. Um, let me up that to um, 100 millivolts. And that's pretty spot on. So we're three and a half digits by the look of it. Let's go to 300. I'm not sure whether it's, um, yeah, okay. So it's not um, three and a half, it's just one point something 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 by the look of it. So I've given it 199 millivolts, so that's pretty accurate. Let's give it just over 200 and see if it, I think it might be limited to just 1.999. So just three and a bit digits. Um, let's just go 0 0.2. Yeah, that's over range. So um, the digit range is 1.999. So let's go up to the next range. So this is a two volt range. So let's give it exactly one volt. So that's pretty accurate. Even though it's a 1% meter, it's actually way, way better than that. So let's give it uh, two volts. This precision voltage source will provide up to 10 volts only. So that's just over range. Let's just go up to the next range. That's the 20 volt range. So let's give it 19. No, I can't give it 19. I can only give it 10. So that's 10 volts. That's pretty accurate, like spot on. Um, it's on the next range, so that's still pretty good. And then the 600 volt range, I would have to use a different meter. I'll do it in another day because this is just a mailbag kind of review. So that's still working quite accurately. So let's just get rid of that. Turn this off. And the other quick test I'll do, just because I can easily, is use my Vichy Precision Resistance Source that Vichy kindly gave to me um, quite a while back. Now, obviously, this meter doesn't do four terminal resistance, um, but I can just run up through the ranges. So let's go around to the 200 ohm range and see how accurate it is for one. Well, first of all, I'll just short it out see what the uh, offset is. So we've got about 0 0.1 ohm, 0 0.2 ohms offset. So there's one ohm. So given the offset, that's pretty accurate. Let's go to 10 ohms. So that's within, um, allowing for the offset of 0 0.2, 0 0.1. That's pretty good. 100 ohms. So that's pretty accurate. Let's go to 1K should be overload. So let's flip up to the 2K range. Now any offsets now in the um, contact resistance shouldn't make any difference whatsoever because uh, we're way beyond that. So that's still pretty accurate. That's a 1K load and it's giving us 0.998. I think the actual value for the 1K is, well, it's lots of zeros from one. So we're uh, way beyond what the accuracy of this meter is. So that's pretty good. Now let's go to 10K. Of course, we'll have to click up a range. So I'm actually quite surprised. This is very, very accurate given the price of the meter and the declared accuracy of it. Uh, it's only about 1% on most of the ranges. But I'm finding it with this is that one percent means that that could be one zero one zero or point nine eight on there. Um, but we're getting this pretty much crack on, so that's very impressive. Now the highest value I've got on here is a one mega ohm precision resistor. So we just go up to the two mega ohm range. Let that settle down. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. One mega ohm or 1,000 kilo ohms. So I'm quite impressed with that meter for the price of it, et cetera, et cetera. We'll have a look at what the specs actually claim to be in a minute when we finish having a look through the products. But um, yeah, that's an RS Pro meter. It's uh, quite small, you know, when I compare it to um, one of my Agilents, and I have a few of those, you can see how much smaller this is. So if you're just putting it in a bag for doing some quick tests, that's pretty good. Now it isn't rated, this, like my Agilent would go up to a thousand volts on the meter, 
uh, this RS one here will only go up to 600 volts on the meter and I don't know whether I would be, well, the leads and everything else, they're nice, they seem to be quite nice leads. They don't feel like they're silicone, um, but they are quite nice and they're heavily shielded. So I think I might trust them up to 600 volts. They do have the uh, protective covers on the ends. They're not on there right now. So with the cover off, they're rated at Cat 2, uh, it says Cat 2 1,000 volts. With the cover on, it says Cat 4 600 and Cat 3 1,000. That just provides additional protection for your fingers. Anyway, that's the uh, meter. We'll give it a fuller test on another video. So let's just turn that off and get it out the way. Now, the bags I've got, um, it seems like a weird thing to send me, but they were just trying to look at a whole different range of products that they could send that I could use that would be helpful in my lab um, because they are a uh, sponsor for me. So these bags, what they are, are they are... Um, anti-static bags. Now what that means is that they will not build up a static charge. So if you start rubbing it together, uh, it won't build up a static charge to damage any components. What it isn't is ESD protected. So if I um, rub my hands against a balloon or my hair or something and built up a static charge on me and I had a component inside this bag and I went zap that discharge would go through the bag. If you wanted to be protecting um, s components from actual static discharge versus static buildup, then these bags would not be suitable. You would have to get some ESD protective bags. This is, this is the um, third hand, as they called it. Let me just zoom in a little bit. So these have been around for years and years and years. Um, I think even when I was an apprentice, these kind of things existed. And they're very handy when you're soldering some wires and things like that, and you want to just simply hold something, you know, um, you, you know and solder it. You can just clip the device in the uh, little grippers, and then, you know, looking through here, you've got a good, clear view of what you're doing. And you can do your soldering behind that and it's much, much easier because you're not trying to hold the component as well. And you can even use the other gripper to hold the wire in place if it was a little bit awkward for some reason. So that's going to be quite useful on the bench from time to time. And it's got a quite a powerful magnifying glass by the look of it. Uh, I'm not sure if it's plus three or plus five diopter, but it's something in that region. Uh, nice metal base so that uh, it'll stay put when you put it down. So that's really cool. Um, let's get rid of that a second. The uh, solder, well I think the solder kind of speaks for itself. That's going to be useful around the lab. The uh, lead free is um, less useful for a lot of things I do because I prefer to use leaded solder when I am doing um, building circuit boards on uh, strip board and things like that. Um, I think I've just never really got into lead free solder and you also have to, I believe, increase the temperature of your irons. Now before my iron, my old weller was set at a fixed temperature. Now that I've got the new um, weller soldering station, the WX3003, uh, I can just hit a button and within seconds my soldering iron can change temperature. So maybe now is the time to start um, using different solders and things more suitable for the job that I'm doing. Now the um, tinus, what this is for is just simply cleaning your soldering iron tips and, they, and it helps to keep them from building up contaminants and things on the solder tip. So these are the ESD safe cutters. So the, the, they feel really, really nice in the hand actually. The um, cushioning, the padding on the handles is very nice and as you can see with these ones they do actually have the RS logo in, uh, engraved into them with the uh, white filler to make it stand out. Now these are only really designed for copper wire, so normal printed circuit board things. If you start trying to cut um, steel bolts or anything like that, you're going to put nicks all over them and make them pretty useless. So uh, I would definitely recommend just keeping these for doing your circuit boards. So next up we have the RS branded um, desoldering tool. This is the uh, hand pump action, you put it in and you just press the button and away it goes. Now the one I've had for years, let me just go grab it. Okay, so this is the one I've had for years and years and years. Uh, as you can see, the uh, anodizing is well worn off 
uh, because of all the years that I've had this. And this one has quite a powerful um, sucker on it, um, and it's, but it's got a little bit of, if you can see that on camera, the recoil uh, is quite heavy. It, it is supposedly recoilless, but um, I think they probably got a little bit better at it. It's also got a solid um, PTFE tip on here as well. So if you've got it against the PCB and you see how my finger just flew off of there because of the recoil, um, it will bounce and potentially could damage a pad if you're not careful with it. So this new one now from RS is an ESD safe um, desoldering tool and it feels like the soldering action is actually a little less powerful than this one. It certainly recoils slower but it seems to have a uh, tighter um, suction on here because if I actually put my finger over the end of this you can see it runs much slower which means it's getting quite a bit of um, vacuum in here as it's sucking up. Now this one also is just it basically pulls apart. It's actually covered in grease on the inside right now which is normal because uh, it wants to stop the solder from sticking to anything. Um, very easy to take it apart to clean it so you just do that, shake out all your solder, and you're pretty much done. So that's just a half twist. Uh, my old one, you literally have to um, screw and screw and screw. It's made out of aluminum. And you can see here, it's got um, the plunger is actually a separate unit than the pusher. So once you click that in, um, there's less mass when that's down. You can actually pull it up, so uh, quite a different design. But anyway, it's always nice to have an alternative, especially if you're using it with more delicate components and things. Okay, the next component we have here, or tools in this case, are the PCB um, maintenance tools. Now, I actually had, and I think I still have, um, some of these tools from when I was even an apprentice, which means that's 35, four, over close to 40 years ago. Uh, they were almost exactly the same design as these. You have a hook. Um, you have a hook on, on one end. You've got a set of tools. So you've got a hook here for scraping and grabbing wires and things like that. You've got a um, sharp blade for scraping PCBs with a little bit of a file action on it, um, which means you can take some of the coatings off of a PCB if you want to get to the copper. Uh, it's got a little twist tool that you can put a lead in it to put some nice sharp right angle bends or loops and things. And then on the other end of all of the tools, um, you've got a little spike on here for potentially opening up holes or just pushing a bit of solder out of the way or something. Um, you have a very sharp scraper here, uh, which is why it has this protective little plastic cover on it. And um, i just try and push that back on again. And then you have a little uh, wire kind of brush for um, cleaning or scraping on your circuit board. Let me just have a little look. There's no logos on any of these tools, but let me just grab, uh, look at my toolbox and see if I still have my original ones. So as it happens, I do. Um, here are two of them that I still have. Now, the difference is, ironically, that the ones I've had for over 30 years actually do have an RS logo on them. Uh, the new ones, the plastic seems a little um, lighter, but they're basically the exact same tool. There's no RS logo on these new ones. Um, so that's, again, like I said at the beginning, that might be something that RS wants to uh, look at. But one thing I do notice in the design, for instance, this is the new one with the great big hook on the end. And my original one, you can see the difference here. The hook is much, much smaller. Um, probably for wire wrapping and things like that. So they probably changed this for a different purpose. Um, the other end, the, uh, the little angle piece is pretty much exactly the same. Um, I think the angle is slightly different, but it is possible that I bent that for some reason to change it. And then um, I still have the one with the really sharp edge on. I've actually resharpened this a couple of times over the years but uh, still going strong. So that is, um, I think, a testament as to the longevity of a lot of the RS branded tools that they, you know, when you, you spend a little bit more money getting them, yes, 
but they last you a long time. And just as it happens, uh, while I was rummaging in my toolbox, I found a bunch of other ones. This is a uh, ratcheting crimp from RS that I got a long time ago. It looks like I need to put a bit of WD-40 on it, but it still works just perfectly fine. Um, some screwdrivers. These are all RS brand, big heavy one. I mean, this thing been used and abused for well over 30 years. Uh, ratcheting screwdrivers. Uh, again, RS branded Superdrive number two from RS. There's the logo still here, made in England. I'm not sure if they're all made in England anymore. Um, socket wrenches, um, files, RS branded, um, small screwdrivers. So I have a lot of tools uh, that I've had for probably over 35 years um, since I started my electronics. So that is definitely a testament as to the quality that you can get from RS, so I like that. Anyway, enough of that. Let's move on to the next tool in the, or the next uh, thing in this package. So these are the prototyping boards. They're the um, K&H brand GL-36. Um, so you basically got 62 or 63 positions down. You got three rows for components with power and ground rails for each one. Now these ones are not marked with the little lines on which I typically see on a lot of my prototyping boards, but that's okay. You can easily put it on with a marker if you wanted to. But it, you know, it really means you're just free to do whatever you like with it. Uh, you've got a top bus strip across here and you also get a set of colored um, terminals that you just screw into the top here um, so that you can use banana plugs from your bench power supply and then have your wires coming out to plug in wherever you want. So there's two of those. Um, you can never have enough. I've actually, again, this is another example where I've had one for a long, long time, uh, about the same time as I've had all of the tools. And it's still going. Let me just grab it and show you. So this is the one that I've had for a very, very long time. It's in a die-cast aluminum um, box, the mains cable is just wrapped around it. It's a switch mode power supply inside and I've got plus and minus 12 volts and plus 5 volts available. Um, this switch with the extra two connectors, I think I had some ideas 30 odd years ago what I was going to do with it, but I never did implement it. But this has been um, a workhorse for me for a long, long time and you can see in certain areas um, where I've managed to um, destroy components and things like that. For instance, here you can see where I've basically melted the um, board with some components, but it's worked very, very well. I think some of the connections are now starting after 30 odd years to get loose. Now, I'm not sure if this was an RS one or not, um, but I think it probably was because it was at the time when I worked for a company that we bought all of our parts from Radio Spares. It wasn't RS branded, uh, I don't think. Um, but nevertheless, uh, you know, it was um, a good quality one. I think the box definitely came from RS. They used to sell all these kind of die cast boxes and still do um, for things. So um, anyway, nice to have some new prototype boards that are going to have some good connections and things on them. And one of the uh, electronic items I've got, this is a smart meter. It measures power on up to three phases. It needs current transformers and voltage taps going on to what you're measuring. And it will actually monitor the power, power factor, um, frequency, phase angles. It will accumulate the kilowatt hours, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very versatile uh, meter. It, the um, website says it's DIN rail mounting, but as you can see, it isn't. It is uh, chassis mounting to go into some kind of panel, which is fine and it's got some nice connectors on the back. I actually have it wired up right now to some mains just so I can show you it turned on and it's measuring the mains here at 121 volts at the moment. But I have no current transformers. I have to speak to my contact at RS Components and see if he can send me some uh, current transformers so that I can actually uh, test this thing out a bit better. But um, it's a nice unit and I had a quick look at the manual. It's got a lot of programmable flexibility in it. Um, and you know a lot of different things, total harmonic distortion. So we'll have a little look at this in a separate video and maybe I'll open it up so we can see what's inside. But it's got a huge amount of flexibility and one of the nice things is um, it's got multiple outputs. The bottom here is all about the measurement side down here where all your power would go in. Um, this is the supply to drive the unit so um, it, would be, it wouldn't be counting 
the current that's actually being used to drive your loads, which is nice. But it also has a post, two pulse outputs that you can set independently that will indicate uh, just with a pulse, uh, I'm not sure if it's a closed contact relay or an actual uh, logic level coming out, but it would indicate a pulse every kilowatt or so many pulses per kilowatt hour and things like that. But it also has an RS-485 um, connection and it implements a Modbus protocol over the serial port so it's very easy to connect it up to a programmable logic controller, uh, some kind of computer and things like that. So some of my other projects, I've actually been using the Modbus protocol to talk to various devices. So what I'm going to do is I'll set this up so that we can actually play with it and have a look at what it can do. And maybe I'll integrate it into one of my projects as well as a more permanent fixture, which would be kind of nice because it's always good to be able to properly accumulate um, the readings that you're getting from power and stuff like that. The last thing I have here, of course, is the ESD um, rack uh, cabinet. Now, the nice thing about these is that the difference, this is ESD, not anti-static. So if I have components in here and I pick this up, uh, maybe from the bottom and I, got, and I go to pick something up and I've got static, this will not um, allow the static discharge to go through it. Now, I don't know, I don't have a high voltage generator but maybe one day we'll uh, see if we can set up an experiment where we can uh, show the difference between anti-static and um, ESD protection. Uh, I know Dave Jones on the EEV blog has done some really cool demonstrations, so um, you can check out his site and have a look if you don't want to wait. But at some time in the future, if I can get the um, equipment set up to do it, maybe we'll try that out and see if we can demonstrate it. Uh, but this is going to be very useful for storing some of my ESD sensitive devices where I don't want to zap them. Um, and I think that's all of the components. I mentioned that we, I also got um, stepper motors and um, a stepper motor controller and I will be doing a complete video on that uh, in a separate video because it's part of my CNC projects and I'm going to be building a PCB mill with um, the CNC and the stepper motors that I have here. So uh, I will reserve going into more detail of those until I start doing that project. Um, but that completes the mailbag. We will just go and have a quick look at some of the specs and the links to the products on the website. Um, but that's just everything that I'm going to show you physically um, in front of the camera. So let's go to the web, have a quick look at the specs on the uh, RS website and prices and things, and I'll provide all the links, and that'll be it. That's another mailbag over. I've just got each of the different data sheets lined up to make it a little bit easier. So let's just start with the one I have right here, which is the RS Pro 12 draw ESD safe cabinet. So here it is, 12 drawers, ESD safe. You get the labels with it. Um, you don't appear to get any dividers for the drawers inside, which seems a bit odd. And I haven't seen anywhere yet to get them. I haven't looked too hard. Any static bags, there is a complete data sheet describing the use and the sizes that are available said these are not uh, ESD shock resistance they just prevent buildup of static not protect components from a static discharge through them so you get a hundred in a pack for 15 pounds this is the RS professionally approved products the um, power meter looks like it's quite programmable to allow you to pick whatever transformer you like and then set the ratios but I'm trying to find out a bit more information before I do a video review on that particular product. Um, for what it does, it looks like it's quite a good deal. Um, it will handle up to three phases, um, three phase with neutral or three phases and or uh, single phase. And it's, as I said, it's doing uh, power factor analysis, um, active power versus reactive power. It's accumulating the watt hours, um, active watt hours, as well as reactive watt hours, etc., etc. So it has quite a lot of features built into it, as well as the ability to measure current up to thousands of amps, depending on the transformer. And it has pulse outputs, as well as a serial RS-485 Modbus output. What I don't see on here is recommended um, accessories, which would be nice to be able to say what current transformers you could buy if you're not using existing ones. Uh, the data sheet also doesn't show too much, doesn't give away too much um, on the product. I did find some original data sheets for the uh, what looks like the direct manufacturer's one. And basically I've come to the conclusion that it will pretty much handle quite a right, wide range of current transformers. 
and you just need to basically program it with the ratio uh, and what that and you know what the voltage in means from a uh, current to volts perspective and stuff like that. So uh, as I said, I'll do a separate video on this once I get that figured out. The RS12 digital multimeter, this, as you saw, is quite surprisingly accurate um, considering that it is quite low cost. Um, it's got a 2000 display dis as we saw. So it'll go from zero to 1999 on its output diode check, continuity check, it's got a 10 amp range uh, and many milliamp ranges and as you can see here the lower voltage is half a percent accurate but predominantly it is sitting at around about one percent accuracy a little bit under one percent just a fraction but in general it's about one percent accurate meter but as you saw with my little test with the volts and resistance it is actually in my case i'm not saying every meter would be like this but probably significantly more accurate than what it is guaranteed to be which is quite nice now over time that might drift but at the end of the day you know um, the spot check that i did seems to show that it is quite a uh, nice meter for its price and this is only 11 pounds so it's as i said you know 11 pounds so you know 15 dollars that's a very low cost multimeter i haven't opened it up yet maybe i'll do a separate tear down on it as well at some point but for the price it is a good entry level multimeter as i said it seems to be pretty accurate uh the dial seems to be quite nice the leads are uh fairly flexible they're not or don't appear to be silicone leads like you get in a much more expensive meter but considering this is almost 20 times less price than an Agilent or Keysight uh, three and a half four sorry four and a half digit handheld multimeter uh, it's doing pretty good so I am actually surprisingly impressed with this little meter uh, soldering iron tip tinner is a data sheet for it uh, again on the RS website here we have the RS Pro lead-free solder. So its melting point is 228 degrees centigrade. And we have the leaded solder, where as you can see, it's about 40 degrees lower. So if you were using the, um, my old Magnusat soldering iron, where the tip sets the temperature, you'd have to be changing the tips if you wanted to have optimal temperatures for the iron. This RS Pro soldering iron soldering tool set so as you can see, we discussed that earlier, you've got um, a fork for twisting and gripping wire for unwinding and various other things. You've got the steel wire brush, a scraper, a knife, a spike, and a hook. Um, and you saw from the earlier one, the design really hasn't changed much in over uh, 30 years, except for the fact that they've dropped the logo off of the moldings, which when you're trying to promote the RS Pro brand, it would be nice if they still left it on there because if anybody borrows your tools, you would know exactly where they came from or the person borrowing them would and it would help sales and everything else. Uh, desoldering gun, this is the data sheet that covers all of the ones that um, there are. And I think the one that I have, even though the colors are slightly different, is this one here, the FlexiVac 2006. It's black bodied. Um, with a flexible nozzle and price is not too bad 11 pounds 69 for one unit um, These are the cutters that I got um, the flush type cable cutter uh, Anti-static sorry not anti-static. It's ESD safe uh, 13 pounds so a lot more expensive than you would be buying from eBay or something But nevertheless for quality pair of cutters, that's not too bad a price to be paying I know the Lindstrom's that I used to get a long time ago were significantly more expensive than that and that was probably 20 30 years ago that I was buying those and I think from just bad memory that they were in the order of about 30 pounds a pair so way more significantly expensive uh, breadboards these are I got the GL 36s they do have bigger ones the GL 48s I have two of the 36s because I know from experience most of the projects I've ever done even complicated ones have not gotten bigger than what would fit on the GL 36 so I'd rather have two slightly smaller boards than one bigger one and be able to have two different projects on the go uh, simultaneously 
and you can get the um, actual breadboard pieces individually as you can see here and build up your own on a separate backer board if you wanted to. So these are basically 31 pounds a piece um, which again is not too bad. I've actually bought breadboards from a local store here in Canada in, in Toronto and um, when I bought them the guy gave me a little uh, pin strip and said oh you'll need this with the breadboard when you're using it and what it was <laughs> the reason he was giving me this and I didn't quite understand it at the time was because the quality of the um, metal grip inside the each of the holes was not very good and they were actually very very tight and you would pretty much destroy a component if you tried to put it in there without first inserting um, a solid connector which was basically the little strip of connectors that he gave me into the sockets um, to widen them very slightly and ease some of the pressure um, before you started trying to put components in and I've actually already tried this one with a few smaller components and they do fit in very very smoothly which is nice um, so that's one of the differences between buying a quality breadboard and buying uh, a cheap one and saving a bit of money um, you're going to find it much more pleasurable to use and you're not going to be impaling your fingers while you're trying to push components into really, really stiff sockets. Now, time will tell as to how well these maintain their contact. Um, as I said, I, you know, in a video earlier, I showed you that I've got one breadboard that I've been using for probably over 30 years and it's still maintaining pretty good contacts. I mean, I've melted a few places and things, um, but in general, it's still performing pretty good. So... I know it wasn't cheap at the time when I put that together, uh, and it's lasted the the years. I have got some smaller breadboards that I've used for various products that I bought from uh, local electronic stores, uh, which were not expensive. You're talking about like you know five Canadian dollars for a small piece of breadboard, and you can actually tell some of the connections are already um, not getting a very good grip on the components that you're plugging into it. You know, and if you think about plugging in small um, dip packages, small resistors, larger resistors, the, the the pin that you're pushing into the holes can vary quite considerably in size, and you want it to be able to grip all of those. So it's important that the spring um, contacts that are inside each of these is of good quality, and they will ret retain its rigidity over time. Um, yeah, the RS Pro name, so all of the products that I have gone through are all from the RS Pro uh, brand. Um, not all of them have the logo on them, which is a bit of a shame because one of the purposes of um, getting these were to have them on my bench and people could see where I like to get my tools from. Uh, not all of my tools come from there, but a um, significant number of them. And as you saw earlier, I've had RS tools for over 35 maybe even 40 years I know as a 16 year old electronics engineering apprentice my tools uh, all of my electronics tools came from RS components way way back then and as you can see I've got a lot of my screwdrivers and other um, tools and they're still going strong nearly 40 years later so that's pretty good I think you know it's worth paying the extra bit of money to get that kind of life out of your tools so that's all of them, and I will provide the link onto the posting that shows you where all of this stuff can be bought from. Um, if you're not in the UK, obviously you can use Ally Electronics, uh, which is our Radio Spares' uh, North American branch, for want of a better word, and you can find most of the parts there as well, including the RS Pro branded products. And if you just simply go to... Um, www.rs.com uh, the first page will actually prompt you for your country so if I just show you that right now all right, you get this page and all you got to do is pick the country you're in now I normally pick the UK because that's where my sponsors are based but normally I would pick Canada if I was wanting to um, buy something here I can find it where is it North America Canada and as you can see it takes me to Allied Electronics or Ally Electronics and they have the RS Pro brands here and everything else so you can also order from here if you want to and obviously ordering locally is going to save you significantly on shipping and you won't be incurring duty and customs fees and brokerage fees and stuff like that so anyway that's it that's the mailbag it's uh, gone on a little bit longer than I hoped 
So um, I will finish it here and in a future video we will do a little bit of a deeper look at the multimedia, the multimeter and also we will be um, evaluating the power meter. I've just got to get some current transformers so that I can use it. Anyway, that's it. See you on the next one. Bye.